Right, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this, the 17th meeting in 2014 of the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee. Can I welcome members and our witnesses who I'll introduce uh, shortly. And I can remind everyone, please, to turn off or at least turn to silent all mobile phones and other uh, electronic devices so they don't interfere with the sound equipment. Uh, item one on the agenda, um, I would ask whether members are content that we take items four and five on the agenda in private later this morning. Yep, is that agreed? agreed. Yep. Thank you. Uh, item two on the agenda um, is uh, draft budget at scrutiny 2014-15. Uh, uh, and um, we agreed previously the committee would take some follow-up evidence on the Scottish Government's uh, draft budget 2014-15 for the current year. Uh, from uh, the enterprise agencies, and I'd like to welcome, therefore, uh, Lena Wilson, Chief Executive, and Ian Scott, Chief Financial Officer from Scottish Enterprise, and Alex Patterson, Chief Executive, and Forbes Duthie, Director of Finance and Corporate Services, Highlands and Islands Enterprise. Welcome uh, back to the committee, uh, to uh, to all of you, and uh, it's a it's a, a change for the committee not to be discussing Scotland's constitutional future. So we'll try and steer off that subject this morning, if if that's at all possible. <laughs> Um, now, before we get into questions, I, I wonder, um, perhaps uh, Lena Wilson and Alex Patterson, you might want to just take a couple of minutes to set the scene and see where you think things are with the Scottish economy and with the enterprise agencies and how you are contributing to uh, our shared ambition of, of economic growth. Lena Wilson, do you want to start off? Thank you, convener, and good morning, everyone. It's nice to be back. Um, just maybe some brief context, uh, first of all, with the general economy. Things are definitely picking up pace. We've seen GDP growth for seven uh, successive quarters. We've got the Fraser of Allender Institute um, saying that uh, GDP growth forecast at 2.3% for the next two years. Unemployment rates are up and unemployment is down. However, that sustained growth that we're all looking for, um, that shift from consumer spending to increased business investments, exports and productivity, uh, still needs to be worked at very hard. And uh, weak growth in the euro is also a continued risk. So that backdrop is very important to understand that in terms of the economic development decisions that we take. A Scottish Enterprise has had, uh, along with our colleagues in high, a very strong performance in the last year. We've had 117 RSA offers, over 6,000 jobs created or safeguarded. FDI, Scotland, has, has a very strong year in inward investment, still over 7,300 jobs. Um, with the Scottish Investment Bank, we've invested £27 million into 104 companies. Uh, that's in the Scottish Enterprise area, and the High have had um, some uh, great investments there too. <coughs> and with our financial readiness, we talked about this at a couple of committees ago, um, actually helping companies access finance, uh, that it wasn't just the availability of finance, it was that companies um, were able to access finance and have the capacity. So we've assisted 378 uh, companies to do that. Um, importantly, our trade and investment support for companies has almost doubled. We've helped 2,500 companies uh, with trade and investment support, and that's 96% up on the year um, previous, so that big push on internationalisation. Um, in terms of efficiencies and savings, we've had a strong track record of service innovation and driving efficiency into Scottish enterprise, into every aspect of the business, and we've exceeded the government's targets in terms of our efficiencies. But all of that is about maximising uh, economic impact. And then finally, for me, our plan going forward for the next three years is about, if I could use one word, it would be more. It would be more confidence, more working sectors, more, more jobs, more innovation, more internationalisation, which is at the heart of Scotland's competitiveness, much more ambition, connectivity and opportunities. Every single penny counts. Our SIB work, we know that our leverage is 1 uh, to 3.3, and we know that we can turn every pound that we invest up to about £9 GVA in the economy, and that will determine every decision we make based on evidence. We'll invest over £330 million into the Scottish economy, and 2014, aside from the constitutional interest, is also a big year for Scotland in so many other ways, so taking every single advantage from homecoming, from the Ryder Cup, and from the Commonwealth Games, and we've got some very interesting statistics about how Scottish companies are doing in terms of that. So maybe that helps you uh, set the scene for the uh, ongoing discussion. Good. Thank you very much. Um, Alec Patterson. Good morning. Um, thank you for the invitation to come back. Just a couple of comments. Um, first, to just reflect on the year that's just finished, and from a HIE perspective, um, a good year in terms of hitting both our financial and non-financial uh, targets. Um, over £93 million was invested in Highlands Islands economy uh, last year. 
um, both through our resources and also um, resources brought in from elsewhere to take forward significant projects. And through investments made, um, over 2,000 jobs will be created, um, significant growth and turnover both at home, but a third of that um, for export markets and many good community projects progressed as well. As you know, we've got a lot of big, significant RSIs, as we call them, regionally significant investments. So a number of them made good progress. Uh, last year, Inverness Campus has gone from being a, uh, an infrastructure project to buildings now gone up, uh, and uh, Enterprise Park and Forest, which was the beneficiary of significant shovel-ready funds, um, well, there's now 600 people employed in that, uh, on that park, which is uh, hugely significant for the, for the Murray economy. And last year saw the rollout of broadband start, something which um, I suspect will probably be one of the most significant investments the Highlands and Islands have seen over many years. Um, so over 10,000 premises already benefiting from, from the rollout of broadband. Uh, our plan for 1417 was uh, launched um, just a few weeks ago. We've called it Building Our Future. It's the first time we've given our plan a name. Um, but I think it says a number of things. One is um, we do see the economy recovering. And I won't repeat what Lena says, but in terms of the Highlands and Islands, the unemployment rates are 2% um, across, across the board. Employment rates are high. We know from our account managed companies that optimism and confidence going forward uh, is increasing. So we think there is lots to build on, as well as the, the very significant opportunities which the region has. And our plan just sets out our four priorities, if you like, the building blocks, which we've had for two or three years now, which we think are the right ones. And uh, our focus is just making sure we drive increased impact through the delivery of these four, uh, these four priorities. Our budget was approved by the High Board last month. And um, you know, we're now two months into the new financial year and uh, motoring on all cylinders to make sure we deliver the, uh, the best economic and community outputs for the Highlands and Islands. Thank you very much. Um, now, if we move on to uh, questions, um, I think we've got some questions to follow up some of the um, uh, observations and recommendations in our previous uh, budget report that looked around efficiency savings in particular, and then I think we can open it up to, to broader issues looking forward and how you're going to utilise your budget for the current year to develop some of the ideas that you've, you've just talked about. Um, I, I want to run this till about 11 o'clock, so we've a little time in hand, but I would ask members if they would to keep their questions short and to the point, and if we could have answers that are as short and focused as possible, that would be very helpful, given I think there will be quite a lot of ground to, to cover. C can I maybe just start off, maybe direct this to, to, to Lena Wilson at Scottish Enterprise, um, uh, picking up an issue that, that we covered in our budget report, which was this issue of the 26.3 million of um, asset disposals that you were requiring to make in the current year in order to make up... Um, the uh, level of uh, income that was uh, required. Now, you've, you've helpfully provided us um, a table um, uh, on structured disposal process of non-strategic assets, which is on page 16 of my papers, but I'm sure you'll have that there, I, I hope, uh, which is a table of, uh, of various properties. Um, and if I look at that table, I see the estimated income figure comes to uh, in aggregate, 27.5 million. So just so I'm clear about this, that that is the amount of money you hope to, to make by disposing of these assets, is that right? Yes. yes. That's fine. Okay. C can you explain what the figure then is along to the right where it says um, disposals, and there's a figure at the bottom of 20.3 million. What's, how does that relate? Can I pick up on that? Rina? Yes, please, the Mr Scott. Yeah. <coughs> The, the, the 20 point three uh, million figure in the box is the accumulation of three of the columns that are above it there. Uh, so it's the cost of the asset, adding on any uh, additional costs that we have incurred on the asset since we bought it, and then taking away any of the assets we've disposed of uh, or partial disposals of that asset. So that shows the kind of the net value or the net cost of those of those three things. Thanks, thanks for that clarity. Okay, and then so this. Um, list of assets. Is this, is this the totality of your property disposals for the year? Well, of, of the year, but the, this is a list of non, what we would determine non-strategic assets. So, um, obviously, we've got some legacy assets that have been around for a while, and these would be assets that the sale of them would not impact negatively 
any investment that we want to make. So there's a whole range of assets that we will hold. And in fact, we'll keep investing in assets. So for example, in Peterhead for the Energetica project, we'll actually invest in new assets there. The Inovo building at Itres at Strathclyde University for renewable energy, we're investing in that building. So these was, are what we would determine to be non-strategic assets that we would hope to dispose of this year. That said, the market is still tight and um, we will, you know, some of them will have to be improved in order to sell and perhaps not all of them will be disposed of, but these are certainly our intentions. Okay, because if, if I then look at a separate section that we, we, we looked at previously in our budget scrutiny, which is the um, strategic forum savings for 2014-15, your strategic forum savings are to be 17.3 million. And uh, according to the breakdown you've provided, uh, property asset disposals represent 14.8 million of that. Is that correct? Yes. So that's an, another 14.8 million on top of the 27 million in this table. No. Do you want me to pick that? Yeah. One? No. The the 14.8 million is the is the element of the 27 and a half million that is required to meet a strategic forum savings target. The the target's 17.3 in total. So the the 14.8 is the the, the element out of the 27.5 that we're likely to sell that uh, can be uh, attributed towards the strategic forum saving. We will we'll generate more income than the strategic forum saving total. Uh, some of it will be based on the asset sales. Uh, some of those asset sales will, will go to other income. Sorry, I'm just a bit confused now. Are you not, are you not double counting here? Because my, my understanding was that the strategic forum money was top sliced from your budget. And in addition to that, you have to find another 26 million, 26.3 million from extraordinary asset disposals. Um, not in addition to that. To be able to manage that top slicing from our budget, we need to be able to generate 26 million pounds. Or per, per our final plan, actually, final, per the final business plan, the figure's actually 23 million now. But um, that's, that, that's what we need to generate to achieve the total income that's required this year. Uh, after taking off the strategic forum savings. Do I quite understand that? Will I have another go at that? <laughs> yes, please. I, I'm, I fear I'm going to be, repeat what, uh, what Ian did say, but the strategic forum savings, you're absolutely right, top slicing from the budget, but then we have to balance that budget and show how we will make those savings. So the contribution will come from various ways. It could be reduced headcount, it could be reductions in premises, it could be any number of efficiencies, and indeed generating additional income through disposal of assets. So this year, how we're going to meet it is to take a portion of many things that we do, and the portion that we're going to take from our strategic assets is less than the total 27 million that we'll reinvest uh, in our work, but it's just a, it's an accounting, I suppose. It's a way of balancing it and accounting for it. But there is no double counting, convener, none at all. I, I, you won't probably have it in front of you, but I could refer you to the financial summary in our published business plan that maybe makes it easier to understand how those figures work, because that starts with the amount of grant and aid income baseline that, that we get for a budget uh, from the government this year. We then take off of that the strategic forum savings amount uh, to come to the, the net figure that we'll get from the government. We then add back on the income we need to generate to get to our total income for the year, which is then used for expenditure. So that shows both the, the 17.3 reduction in our, uh, in our grant and aid and then adds back on the uh, property disposal income to get back to our total income for the year. That, that might help un, uh, the committee understand that. We're actually seeking to be incredibly transparent, so uh, what I do want to make sure that you know we're, that's that's the case. Okay, I'm just, I'm just trying to understand the figures. Um, okay, um, going back to your table on on page 16 of all the assets to be disposed. I mean, just taking the top one there, Presswick International Aerospace Park. You've got an estimated income of a million pounds against that, and yet the cost of the asset is 2.3 million. So that might represent a pretty substantial loss on well, what it cost. Uh, I'll explain that. If you, if you look at the columns that add up to the market value of uh, 1.05, uh, which is why we think we'll get a million for that, we did buy that asset at 2.3 million uh, back in 2005, 2006. 
We have dis had a partial disposal of that, of 600,000. So there's not a loss involved in there. We've already disposed of that and got money for that. But we are looking at a valuation adjustment reduction of about £685,000. So that's the reduction in value since 2005 6 for the land that we've got left that we are going to dispose of this year. However, the market value today is only just over a million pounds. So uh, that, that's what we think we can get for it. But similarly, that's balanced out by other properties and assets in which we'll have gains. So to an extent, as the market operates, it swings and roundabouts. True, but then perhaps if, if you weren't, uh, in effect, being forced to sell in the current year in order to meet a shortfall in your income, you could have held on to that for a few years until the market had improved. We could always hold on to something and uh, we could find ourselves in the same situation. You're absolutely right. So this is a judgment call based on lots of years of experience about when is the right time to sell. I suppose one never really knows with hindsight. OK, thanks. I'll bring in Chick Brody, I think, for some questions. Um, the market valuation, when, was, when were they all done? Those were done as part of our year-end accounts exercise for this year. So By they're whom? valid as of end of March. By whom? Um, our independent valuers. Uh, um, I, I can't, I can't okay. remember what the two that is. I can get that to you. Can I, j j just to, to, we've talked about the, 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 the numbers. I don't go... I'm confused already, but uh, <clears throat> the forum savings said 17.3 million. Part of the income generation was disposals of 14.8 in the schedule that we have. I then go to, if I can find it, <coughs> the published plan versus the current income projections, which shows the uh, contribution of the strategic forum savings of the 17.3 million I mentioned. Then further down, it talks about another £4 million of property disposals. How have you differentiated between... Why haven't they contributed to the strategic forum savings? Why have you differentiated between the two property disposal savings? I, I don't know the exact uh, kind of table that you're, you're looking at there, Chick, but the, the facts are we are going to sell somewhere in the region of £23 million. Pounds. We're going to get generate income of £23 million pounds from our assets. Um, the, the target for strategic forum savings is less than that, so we've allocated an element of that 23 to explain how we're going to meet that target. We could have equally, and at one stage we did, put in the 23 million into the strategic forum uh, savings target table, and it was shown... Sorry? Why did you take it out? Well, it showed that we would could have a total of... It would have been about £26 million. Pounds. I think the question we were asked was, how, what, how are you going to achieve the £17.3 million target? So we showed how we're going to achieve that target. I could equally have said, and we'll exceed that by another £9 million pounds from further property sales that we're going to have. Right. Yeah. I understand the, the cosmetic presentation. If yeah. I may just look at the £23 million, there is one, one item there that represents £7.4 million, which is you know, 35% of the total. How likely is that to happen? This is the uh, Carrickston Park, yep. Cumbernauld. Yep. Um, our business infrastructure team um, have accepted the, the challenge from us to, to generate that level of income this year. It's a challenging target. We all know that. Um, they, they've put that property on there as being a, a non-strategic asset that they believe they can generate that value this year. Um, until we sign the, 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 deed, the, the deal that uh, sells it for that amount. I can't, I can't say that we'll 100% do that. Uh, but the property team are confident that they are going to deliver that list for us this year. Um, so How much will the property agent get if he sells it or she sells it? I, I, I don't know the detail on that, Chick. Um, there'll be, if, if we are using a property agent for that, it'll be the normal kind of level of fees that we would pay for, for that. There's a report a property agent has been competitively procured yes. under the marketing sale yes. of the asset on our behalf. So, yes. you know, it, it, the reason I'm asking this is it's such a high proportion mm. of your targeted savings. Uh, and clearly there has to be some real incentive uh, to ensure that that 7.4 million is saved. So, uh, and that brings into play the cost of that sale. Yeah, I, I, I can't quote the exact figure because I don't know it, but I'm sure it'll be uh, competitive as per any kind of market sale for that type of activity. Uh, we've, as it says, we've procured that openly, so it'll be a competitive price that will pay for that. Thank you, convener. I'm, I'm <coughs> interested in, you know, and it's a question actually for both... Um, Alec and uh, 
Lena, I'm, 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 I'm interested in, in I, I think particularly in your uh, written submission, Lena, you, you, you talked about this problem of you know, ensuring best value, if you know what I mean. If you're selling property and the, the fact that the market, you know, it hasn't recovered um, and therefore there may be, you know, a loss entailed of selling property at this, you know, this time rather than waiting for a couple of years maybe till the market picks up. And I, I absolutely accept that. But I just wonder to what extent you look at, um, you, you know, the, the, the kind of wider economics of property disposal in terms of, you know, if you've got one big shed and you sell it to a sitting tenant and then you use those resources to build another big shed, then it seems to me there's a, a greater public good being served um, than, you know, waiting for a couple of years to get another 10% on the disposal of that property. To what extent do you, uh, you know, undertake that kind of analysis um, prior to making the decisions whether to sell or not to sell, or indeed which properties to sell. And the cost of, of selling I'm trying or not to put selling. it in layman's language sure. no, um, rather than uh, um, economic terms. But I mean, I'm, I, and I think this is pertinent to Alec as well in terms of the, you, you know, um, your disposals. Mm. Um, do you look at that wider economic impact? Uh, absolutely. I mean, it's fundamentally that's really important. I mean, just just to you know, explain to the committee, we don't build many big sheds anymore. So we built the Innovo building in Glasgow for a particular need, a sector opportunity around renewables. But, you know, Scottish Enterprise is much more about um, incentivising the private sector to operate and to develop. So a lot of these are legacy sites. Um, we also take into consideration the cost of maintaining those sites. So these sites sit annually with a cost, uh, security costs or other maintenance costs or the future cost of decontamination. You have to take all of that into consideration as well as the economic benefits. But we would absolutely look at, on one hand, if we sell this and get some income, what can we invest it into? And so especially the stuff that's beyond the strategic forum savings, that's our key investment opportunity to invest that in sectors. So, just to give us a more general feel for this then, um, in, in, in terms of proportion, uh, or, or the proportion of overall value of the properties that you currently hold, what, what proportion in value terms are you disposing of? The, the, the total value in this year's year-end accounts will be somewhere in the region about 140, 150 million pounds. So if we dispose 20 odd million of that, then that's a seventh and eighth of that uh, is the kind of proportion that we're looking at. And you, um, you correct me if I'm wrong, but you said that you know you hope not to um, dispose of properties that has got a strategic importance. Um, what proportion of those remaining properties, you know, would you kind of ring fence in terms of disposal, not disposing because of that strategic importance? The twenty ratio, wasn't it? Um, so twenty percent. Non-strategic, yeah. Eighty percent strategic. Yeah, I mean to be fair, but we're, we're kind of maximising this year the non-strategic side of things. So by default, the the ones that remain are, are pretty well on the strategic list, mate. Right? But when it comes to next year's savings, part of those savings will be realised by future property sales. Am I correct in that assumption? Most likely, yes. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the other thing I think that's fairly critical here, because you mentioned the Prestwick Airport situation. Um, and, and obviously there's a wee bit of a hit there, or a significant hit, perhaps. Um, it, it, given, given, that, um, given that part of uh, Scottish Government policy is about um, reducing regional inequality, um, and maybe I like my uh, comment on this as well, um, to what extent um, are you affected by that um, when you make property investments in areas that, like Inverness, for instance, that are, you know, has been a, 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 you know, a growing area, giving rise to higher property values, as opposed to making investments, you know, in areas where um, the economy is not, is, is kind of languishing, and therefore property values are lower. Because in a sense, you're not talking about the sheds that you put on top of the ground, it's the land under the ground that, you know, um, uh, where, where, where you see, uh, you know, those differences in values actually, you know, arising. Well, I mean, maybe from a high point of view, just one or two comments on, on a number of these points, and, and, and that I'll come back to that. I mean, we're quite clear that we we um, 
we value our assets in the exact same way as part of the annual accounts, and we don't sell below asset value, and we go out and test the market whenever that's whenever we're selling a, selling a property. The comment about um, do you consider the wider economic um, issues when you're disposing of property? Yes, we do, and we've had examples where um, we've actually decided not to progress with some property sales because we thought um, either the economic benefit wasn't sufficiently great or it could be detrimental, particularly to sort of some of our more remote and, and fragile and fragile areas. I think the other thing to bear in mind is that you know, whenever we sell an asset, then it's for reinvestment in other projects. So uh, they are they are they are um, contributing towards. Um, new projects, and we have a strategic infrastructure plan which uh, sets out um, where we think we want to make investments in property or, or, or land um, land preparation to encourage uh, new build. Um, in terms of the regional uh, economy or regional inequalities, um, that is a really important consideration because um, sure there are headline projects like Inverness campus, um, but I could equally take you to projects um, about to go on site in Dunoon right now to expand uh, the business park down there. There are, there are buildings we put up in Orkney. We've partnered with private sector developers in Campbelltown. We've contributed towards the community's development of um, industrial units in, uh, in Golston Estate in, in the Western Isles, um, likewise in Ullapool. So I am of the view that strategic investments or well-chosen investments in property and infrastructure are actually catalysts for economic development across the Highlands and Islands but we have a very clear focus on making sure that it doesn't become an Inverness-centric thing. And these are just a few examples, Mike, of, of, of infrastructure investments, property investments we've made across the Highlands and Islands um, to make sure that you know, opportunities are, are, spread, are spread fairly. If I want to make additional comment. I think, well, the other, another important element is, is market failure. And in terms of want to build something in Western Isles, for argument's sake, um, quite often the reality is it costs more to build something in Western Isles and that actually ends up being, being worth in a commercial operation. Um, and if we didn't step in there and actually do that, then the private sector would not come in. So that's, that's very much developing and pushing our, our economic development role in that aspect. And uh, in terms of the impact that has on our accounts and such like, um, that's, that's well recognised by, by the Scottish Government. And we get our non-cash allocations for, for depreciation, for, for, for write-offs and such like, accepting that, that, that reality. Um, but as Alex rightly uh, says, we, we're not, we don't wish to be long-term landlords. What we want to do is promote a commercial property market, and therefore if we can get an exit that makes economic sense for the area and the region, then we'll, we'll take that at, at, at every opportunity. Um, so really, that, that's what, what, it, what it is. But we turn over probably about 10% of our property every year in that, in that sort of context. Um, our property portfolio is probably in the region of 45 million. We sell about four and a half million of you know, capital receipts a year. So it's that, that sort of reinvestment to, to look for more opportunity. Yeah, because once a business park is, 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 is let and established, it would be wrong for us to sit there in the longer term if we can release that funding and go and do something else. I'm, and I'm getting that picture. Just one further brief question, uh, Convener. It's a compound question. Um, but uh, I just wondered that, you, you know, you mentioned in the written submissions that one, one of the problems sometimes in disposing of properties is that you may, you may have a, a sitting tenant who would, who would love to acquire it, but they're unable in these difficult times to, to raise the finance. Um, I wonder if you've considered, you know, or, or, or employ shared equity schemes similar to... Uh, you know, uh, some of the social housing schemes that allow people to buy progressively. Um, and a final comment, I mean, I, I, my ears pricked up when Alec mentioned a uh, 2% unemployment rate in the Highlands and Islands. Um, I, I mean, are, are, you not, are, you, are you sure about that figure? Are, are you not referring to the, to the claimant rate, um, which understates unemployment? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you'd agree with me that it understates unemployment to perhaps a f to, to the extent of maybe 50% or so? There are, there are, there are two different measures. Yep. Uh, so I consistently, <coughs> use, I consistently use the claimant count one, but it is lower than the other one. Yeah. You know, if John Swinney's listening, I would hate him to form the impression that everything's rosy, that that represents true unemployment, that, that I would hate him not to recognise that we export a lot of our unemployment in the Highlands and Islands. I would hate him not to recognise that things might be 
present a different picture, were, were it not for the renewal of oil and gas activity in Shetland to, to quite a significant degree. So I just thought it was worth putting that onto the record. That really doesn't represent a true picture of Highlands and Islands. Okay. There are two different measures. I've used the claimant count one. However, um, on the 18 travel to work areas across the Highlands and Islands, unemployment has fallen year on year since last April to this year in 17 out of the 18. So there is a, an underlying reduction in unemployment, which is good. So, yeah, we'd, let's not pretend everything in the garden's rosy. There are challenges, but, you know, that's not a bad position to be in. Yeah, Dennis, come in briefly and then check. Uh, just a brief one on that, just because we're looking at the figures. I mean, you've, you've also, got, if I remember right from the figures, was that a 7.5% um, increase in the population growth. Is that population growth due mainly to people coming in from the skills sector, or is there other reasons? It's, it's, a, com it's a combination of things. Uh, goodness, man, we should maybe give you a wee... So we've got a wee profile of the whole population sort of changes in the Highlands and Islands. Um, there, there, are, there are issues underneath it. The, the population of the Highlands and Islands is marginally older than the rest of Scotland. We still have an imbalance in young people who, who leave for higher education, which is why UHI and other things are, are so important. Um, but in every other age range beyond that, there is a net growth... <coughs> I was just looking at the increase aspect because it, th there is an increase in the population figures, isn't there? Yes, there is. There is. And, it's, and it's, it's not universal. So, you know, if you look at places like uh, Guile and Butte, there's been a decline. But Highland Council area, Western Isles, Orkney, Shetland, significant increases over the last uh, population census. Thanks. Uh, Chip, do you want to come back in? Yeah, yeah. Just uh, if I may come back to Alec and, and uh, Forbes. And by the way, I should have said good morning. Um, <coughs> when I look at the the properties you've disposed of, about 2.1 million, according to the sale price, and, and the asset valuation, there's a difference of 25%. Now, that's either good sale, selling and marketing, or the valuations are wrong. Um, I'm confused by the comments, Forbes made a comment that commercial, make commercial sales that make economic sense, and Alex said, you'll never sell below asset value. Now, it comes back to, again to the accuracy of the, 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 the uh, valuation. I mean, what is the policy? Is it you will not sell below the asset value or given all of the other attendant costs of buildings lying empty in terms of energy, a need for maintenance, loss of interest on cash? I mean, what is the policy that you're applying? Oh, is it cost of ownership? Is it simply an asset valuation? What is it? Yeah, I mean, the... the, the, the the baseline is we cannot sell, we will not sell below asset value. That's the starting point. And then you're looking at, well, what price will the market pay for different, for different properties? So you're right. You know, we've asked ourselves the question, are the asset values correct? But they are done independently as part of the, the annual accounts and Audit Scotland. You know, we're comfortable with that approach. But the basic absolute ground is, you know, we do not sell below asset value. I don't even allow to. No, no, no. no. Commissioner. I've made the point about valuation. Scottish Enterprise. Have you, what's same policy? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's the public finance manual policy that uh, market value. Uh, you, can, you can't dispose of some below market value. Clearly, all of the costs that you, you outlined there will form part of that independent valuation. Just before I need to move on, and talk about other issues, but I just want to go back um, and just get some try, try and get some clarity on this, this property disposal issue because I've, I've been looking again at the table. It's on page eight of my papers, but it's it's headed Table 1, 2013-14 Published Plan versus 2014-15 Current Income Projections for Scottish Enterprise. I don't know, Ian, if, if you've got that one in front of you, but this is the one that, that, that shows your 2014-15 your, your draft budget, starting with grant and aid baseline of $220 million, of which the contribution to strategic forum savings of $17.3 million comes off it. In, there is then added in 46.1 uh, in your transfers, giving you a total anticipated grant and aid of 248.9 million. Now, if I look at that second column, of the strategic forum savings, there's 14.8 that are property disposals. There's a further property disposal line of 4 million, and then additional income from further asset realisations of 26.3 million. Now, it's a long time since I did O-grade maths, or sorry, arithmetic, but I make that 45.1 million in asset disposals. Is that, am I right? 
I'm still trying to find the table we're talking about. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I got an, I, I, yeah, for the record, I got an A in O grade arithmetic, right. but it was yeah. it was a long time ago. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure the numbers add up. I, I'm, I'm happy to come back to you maybe on a, maybe a more written basis on that one if, if that would help. To could you help us with exactly question. what table you're looking at so that we're looking at the same thing because that might. We'll, we'll, we'll get a copy, don't you? It's from okay, your, no, I've got, I've got it's from your submission that. to the budget. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That, that, that was the original sub submission that we did uh, before the previous committee. Yep. That's right, yes. I'm, I'm looking at the second column there, yep, in which is, which is the draft budget yep. for, for the year we're talking about. Yep. And what I'm saying is you've got 17.3 strategic forum savings, of which we know 15.8 is asset disposals. You've got a subsequent line below that for property disposals of four million, and then you've got twenty six point three yep. additional income. Now I make that an aggregate forty five point one million in property disposals. Is that is that correct? Uh, no, it's not correct. You can't add those things together. Uh, as, as I outlined earlier on, what the, there's a, a, a minus seventeen point three. Sorry, am I looking at the right figures here then? Yeah. The. The minus seventeen point three comes off our grant and aid, so that reduces the amount of grant and aid available yes. to us from the government. To try and make that up to maintain our expenditure levels, we then add back on the property disposals that we're going to have. Per that table, you would be right to add the four million and the twenty six point three at that time, um, to say that we needed to generate no. about no. thirty million from that. No, I, I'm sorry, I, I simply don't agree with your arithmetic, Ian. I think you're double counting. It's a, very, it's a very simple mathematical equation. In fact, it's not even that. It's an arithmetical equation. Okay. To, to, to make your, to, you're right. Your 17.3 is top sliced off, but yep. you're making up that 17.3 by 14.8 in, in in property disposals. You can't you can't count the same figure twice. I, I'm I'm not seeing a figure of 14.8. No, 14.8 is included in your 17.3. Yep. The information you gave us was, was your 17.3 was made up of 14.8 in uh, property asset, asset disposals and property income. Yeah. Well, look, um, can you maybe come back to us about this? Because yeah, I think we, to, we need to get an understanding frankly, of it. The 14.8 is definitely included within the 26.3. The, the I think, I think in that case you're double counting it. You can't well, count the same figure twice. No, we're, well, no, we're definitely the, not double counting it. We're not double counting it. I, I'm happy to come back. And, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And what's the total value of Scottish Enterprises' property holdings? I think it's about 140 to 150 million pounds is what we'll probably have in our year-end accounts this year. Right. So it's quite a large chunk you're selling off this year. Yep. I, as as Forbes says, uh, Forbes uh, normally turns over about 10 percent. We we normally turn over a bit less than that. It's normally been about four or five million pounds for the last few years. Mm -hmm. uh, I think our three-year business plan that, that was published shows that for next year we are increasing that significantly because of those additional reductions up to 23. But then it goes down to about 8.8 .8 the next year and about 3.4 the year after that. So we, we're probably in the region of about six million pounds a year if you were want to average that out normally. But we're increasing that significantly next year because of the additional reductions that we've got. And your strategic forum savings for next year will be another 17 million, you would expect? We, are, uh, we, we think it will be at the moment, yeah, we're anticipating that. There has been no confirmation of what uh, any savings next year would Which be. Which presumably will require time. more property disposals. Well, we, there'll be some property disposals. Right. Again, I think the, the, the plan that, that we publish shows that we're looking at 8.8 .8 million next year. You'll actually see an increase in the investment um, disposals next year. We hold uh, equity in companies, and we believe that we're now at the stage where we can get some return on, on those assets as well. So it's probably going to be more on the equity side next year than it is on the property disposal side. Right. Okay. 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 I, wonder, yeah. Bami, I, yeah. I can tell on at least one side of the committee there is, uh, you know, kind of uh, disquiet in terms of uh, these figures, and that, that really is not our intention today. So. We are seeking to be very, very transparent. There is no double counting. But I wonder if between committees we can find a way to iron some of this out so that we're not sitting here, not, not looking at the same table sometimes and not looking at the same figures, because I don't think that's in anyone's interest. So, I mean, I would be willing for us to be as open as possible, sit with members and really go through all of this so that we don't have this scenario, which we do seem to keep coming back to, and it's not satisfying for anyone. 
Yeah, okay. Well, we can, we can follow that up with you. Separately. Thank you. Okay, I think we can probably move on to talk about other issues unless anybody wants to <laughs> follow this up further. Um, I'll bring in Dennis Robertson. Uh, and good morning. Um, Island and Islands, you've got a very, you've got a very um, I, I think, a ambitious or an aspirational programme for the future. Um, how much of that future projection in terms of income generation is uh, attributed now to the rollout of broadband? <coughs> If you're looking at the budget table in our submission, then the rollout of broad, the, the income we will get to roll out broadband is not in these figures, so that is over and above the figures which we've which we've got there. So, the the superfast broadband, community broadband, and our contributions to the Scottish Land Fund is an addition to what's um, what's noted there. Equally, the expenditure is um, is net of these figures too. Do you see broadband as a, an opportunity uh, for bringing in uh, additional business? Islands. Broadband is, from my point of view, the most important thing we're trying to do in the Highlands and Islands because it both transforms what current businesses can do. It makes the region more attractive to emerging investment, and we know um, you know that's that, that's an important factor. It makes some of the issues of distance and geography less relevant because you can do things over um, over um, digital connectivity. So. We, you know, as I as I have probably said here before, but said in many other places, getting the fibre on the ground is just the start. Exploiting it for economic and community benefit is really where we'll start to see the difference. So yes, um, the infrastructure is a is a means to an end, not an end in itself. Yeah. I'll come back to you in a second as well. With, with Scottish Enterprise, you actually see that as a bit of a challenge, don't you? In terms of you, you, you I think one of the part of your submission was saying that. Uh, uh, part of the challenge for you is the fact that there's there's not uh, adequate digital connectivity in broadband in certain areas. That's right, and we're working a lot with the Scottish Government's digital team on that very front. It's such a key to competitiveness, uh, access to that speed and capacity of connectivity, Dennis, that's right. I'm just wondering how much that does impact on in terms of future development and how off-putting it is for maybe encouraging business to come in? Would you be able to sort of project a, a figure on that? So, so, so far, I mean, I, I don't think uh, any inward investment hasn't been able to come to Scotland because of lack of connectivity. So, I mean, it's not hampered any investment. Um, I wouldn't be fair to say that I can put my hand on heart and say that it stopped any business from growing. Um, and certainly we talked to businesses a lot about the communications issues and, and the way that we did with the banks, we intervene with the providers, we influence on their behalf, we do all of that with our account managers, but we haven't lost any investment to Scotland because of lack of connectivity, to my knowledge. Yeah. S&E basically are looking at having a, a increasing your global market and a part of that would be the exports. And I think, I think you used a term... A smart exporter program. Can you maybe explain what smart exporter program is? This is a program that runs actually throughout uh, Scotland and has been one of the reasons why we've been able to almost double our um, activity. Uh, so we've reached thousands and thousands of businesses that really haven't had any paid any attention to exporting. So this is the program to get new exporters exporting because as we've talked to this committee about before. The issue is that most of our exports come from a couple of big sectors and we've got too few companies exporting. So this is the initiative to, from awareness raising, market development, product development, into advisory services to reach as many companies uh, as, as possible, often very small companies. So looking at sort of looking at the innovation side and some sort of new entrepreneurial um, developments, yeah? Yes, everything from um, um, you know how you export, so very basic awareness to awareness of what markets you could export to, how your product could be packaged, um, um, how you the technical side of exporting, guarantees, licenses. It's really that step-by-step -step approach um, to open up minds to exporting because all of our research tells us that companies think it's more difficult than it is to export uh, so when they become more aware, when they understand, when they meet other companies who are doing it, they're more likely to do it themselves. How fragile is that? Because I think, again, in your submission, you're saying it, that a lot of this is based on partnership and collaboration. I, I, do, I don't think it's fragile at all, Dennis. I think the fact that we are collaborating and that there's such robust support throughout Scotland now, I think that's a very good thing from Business Gateway all the way through. I think there's a very joined-up team of Scotland approach to 
you know, making Scotland much more international. So I think it's actually stronger than it ever was, the collaboration. That's great. Yeah. Highlands and Islands. I mean, basically, again, I think you were, you're hoping to develop new export opportunities. Is that right? Well, there's, 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 yeah, I mean, there's two basic strands to the exporting approach. One is to help those who are currently exporting do more, and the second is to help companies who don't export to consider exporting. And that's, as Lena says, that's really what the Smart Exporter Programme is designed to do, help those you know, take the first steps towards exporting. So that, that's, that's the twin track of our internationalisation support, grow what we've already got into new markets, uh, and secondly, to encourage and help support um, those who don't to, to, to look at exporting. Because as Lena said, the risks are often over-emphasised and the benefits maybe under-emphasised. So that's our plan. I mean, you've got traditional companies that are exporting, so you're, you're continuing to support them and you're looking at new opportunities. Yeah. Absolutely. OK. And is that primarily within the food and drink for yourselves? It's across the, across the board. Um, food and drink is important, and we, we run the Access to Market programme for food and drink companies, so that, that is vitally important. No, but it's, it's across the board. You know, I, I, I think one of our most internationalised sectors is the creative industries. And so we're doing a lot of work, um, a new strategy of creative industries, a major part of which will be uh, international trade. But any company that we work with, account managed company, um, who have aspirations to export, we will support them irrespective of the sector they're in. And maybe lastly, uh, again, just looking at the export market, um, s and &E are looking at <coughs> new areas, um, China uh, and sort of the Asian continent. Uh, uh, and I think you mentioned in your submission again that you know although you're still uh, looking at the European market because of the uh, the problems in and around the euro, uh, y you are looking towards the other markets as a sort of um, sort of uh, a preference in terms of the export market. That'd be right. I, th I think, Dennis, it's a both-and strategy, not either-or. So um, some of the European markets are still very, very important for, for Scotland, France, Germany, for example. But if you look at what's happening to Scotland sectors, this massive internationalisation of oil and gas. So we've got an office now um, uh, with SDI in, in Calgary, in Ghana. Uh, we'll be opening up in Kenya. So following that market opportunity where the sectors are growing, uh, Perth, Western Australia, it's very, very opportunity-led and uh, that will continue to be the case. What do you anticipate the value of that to be in terms of...? It's, it's, it's very hard to say. I mean, you, you're not going to turn this around in a year. We're going to... This is about, um, you know, some of it's quite frontier stuff, some of it's about building capacity, some of these are quite, you know, challenging markets in terms of lots of opportunity, but difficult to work in, so... It's should not aspirational. Uh, it's it's absolutely uh, and uh, you know in terms of some of the results we've seen I think we've got you know tens of Scottish companies already in Perth Western Australia um, uh, you know track oil telling us they wouldn't be in Australia but were not for the support that they got from us this is very important on the ground particularly in challenging markets like Western Africa I mean is there any way that you could project any sort of projected um, figures in terms of how beneficial it would be to s &E in terms of projected income? Well, yes, you could, you could look and see uh, um, in terms of uh, what exports... Sco so you could look at what does Scotland export to Ghana last year and what will Scotland have exported to Ghana in two years' time and uh, you'd be able to tell quite quickly, year on year, how many Scottish companies are getting into to market. And Highland Islands is the same in terms of your, your, your global market. You're looking right across uh, new... New areas. Yeah, I mean, we're, we we work together in partnership through through SDI. You know, we know that Highlands and Islands businesses for them, the European market is still vitally important. But you know, the Asian market and these emerging markets, particularly for oil and gas, are as relevant to us as the rest of Scotland. Lastly, with SNE, you, you, you've you've um, restructured your account management profile. Is that right? We have. We brought in a very um, a even more differentiated approach. Uh, really looking at the value, um, to, so putting the best resource into the most likely uh, value, focusing on high growth and internationalisation, and we have just embedded that very recently. So it's taking a step further on that segmentation, if you like. And you anticipate that that will give you a higher return at the end of the day? Well, that's what we're looking for. I mean, uh, we had uh, quite a record year for the increase in turnover through our account-managed uh, companies, and... Uh, 
um, what all of that. We did a, a very big evaluation into account management, which showed us, uh, you know, 70% satisfaction. Showed us that companies that we work with are likely to grow at a much faster rate. Showing us that 70% of those companies are SMEs, and we used all of that evaluation again. This this obsession with evidence to allow us even further to differentiate and segment. So this idea of global account teams, Dennis, if a company is looking internationally, they won't just have the Scottish Enterprise Account Manager. That account manager will be leading uh, often a global account team with SDI personnel, with sector specialists. and So putting as much resource behind Scotland's greatest opportunities as possible, which will yield greater economic impact. Mentioned this year is a particularly important year, and yeah, I'm just going. Uh, and and uh, uh, you're taking advantage, full advantage of it. We are, we are. Um, we've had, um, I think, twenty odd million pounds already of business for companies for, out of the Commonwealth Games. We've got a whole range of Scottish companies who've already got business through the Ryder Cup, um, and uh, that's been, you know, much more than the proportion around the Olympics where we did well as well. So that's really important. I mean, the account management, it's about £5.50 GVA for every pound we spend now in account management. So it's very significant, and the aim is to get that figure uh, you know, up as the years go on. Very generous for your time <laughs> allocation for me, so I think I'll start there. <laughs> Exceedingly generous, <laughs> Deputy Commissioner. OK, I need to move on. Margaret McDougall. Yes. Thank you. Uh, and I wanted to ask you questions around the account management as well. Part of that has has been answered on, you know, the ratio between SMEs and multinationals or national uh, companies who are on your books. I think you said it was 70% are SMEs, is that correct? 76% of our portfolio, Margaret, are SMEs. Yeah, so does that mean that 24% uh, are then multinationals or what's that made up Well, of? unfortunately, they won't quite be multinationals. Uh, in Scotland, SME, you know, beyond an SME isn't often quite a multinational, but some of them could be multinationals. So, um, for example, companies like uh, FMC from Houston, Texas in, in the oil industry, uh, they are account managed by Scottish Enterprise, but we've you know, helped them create hundreds of jobs in Scotland and R&D Centre in Bells Hill. and So they would get the same service. I think I said to this committee before, when you're in Scotland, we regard you as a Scottish company and we want to see you expand. A lot of our inward investment comes to Scotland to then export from Scotland, so it's very, very important as part of Scotland's internationalisation. Amazon, one of these companies? That Amazon, is, yes, yeah. is, is yeah, company so we support. Um, how do you balance that, you know, given that Amazon are one of the companies who are um, not paying all the taxes that it should be? I think we've covered this extensively at this committee uh, before, and uh, I, I, I think I'll just be giving the same answer as before. Obviously, you know, company taxation is, I don't set that, it's not a matter for Scottish Enterprise. What's really important to me is the economic impact that companies like Amazon make in Scotland. And, you know, Amazon are a big contributor in terms of jobs to the Scottish economy. They've got their um, service centre in Edinburgh, uh, in addition to the fulfilment centres. Um, so, the, you know, the, the taxation element is, uh, is, is, be, is beyond me, Margaret. Yeah, it's just it's a pity that these things are not looked into when we're looking at funding these organisations. I say it's very clear. So they, they, have, they met all the criteria for regional selective assistance in terms of the nature of jobs that they were uh, creating. And so in terms of the existing criteria, they, they met all of that. So in um, account managed companies, how many new companies have you taken on in the last year into the, to be account managed? So in the last year, I'm going to have to put my glasses on to look at this one, we had uh, 273 companies come into the portfolio of around the 2,200. And I think I've told the committee before we want to keep growing that uh, amount. Um, but interestingly, we had 183 leaving the portfolio. That churn is very important. It's not a static portfolio. Um, so we're looking for new companies that are growing to come in. But there are maybe some companies that aren't growing so fast or are... are don't have the ambition or don't want to work internationally, and it's very important that they um, you know, leave that portfolio as well. So 273 joined it. So that's an increase of over 10%. Uh, and on entrepreneurship, how many uh, 
companies have you helped, you know, entrepreneurship wise? I mean, I was reading some figures and some, and they seemed not terribly high for, uh, you know, entrepreneurs. And I think it was around 50 who you had helped. Is there any way that you can boost that number? I would hope we could boost it. I mean, I, we should, I've said to the committee before, I'll never be hampered by the number of resource we can put into companies that can grow. I'll find that from somewhere. So the key to entrepreneurship is Scottish enterprise is about high impact entrepreneurship. And I want to differentiate between entrepreneurship and startup. Startup support is the domain of the business gateway, uh, which is doing a very good job there. Uh, and what we're seeing is the flow through from some of those companies that grow from business gateway into account management. That's where some of the 273 is coming from. The kind of entrepreneurship Scottish Enterprise is about is about high growth. Uh, and uh, uh, you're right, we supported 43 companies with our specialist high growth unit. And those are companies that are going to become uh, account uh, management. Uh, in addition to that, we've had seen 54 companies get EDGE awards uh, through uh, that very specialised entrepreneurial uh, support. So Scottish Enterprise's role in this is about high impact entrepreneurship, high growth. Uh, entrepreneurs that will be, you know, growing companies, employing uh, lots of people in fast-growing markets in Scotland's key sectors. The business startup side of it is for Business Gateway. Do you have a, a good working relationship with Business Gateway? Do you we have a very good working relationship yeah. with Business Gateway, and um, you know, throughout the country, that's really, really important. Our market, if you like, for our, our source of new companies to work with, a huge part of that should come from Business Gateway. Do you give us an example of what uh, the, these new companies are, the entrepreneurs that are, are now uh, being established? Well, they're in a whole range of Scotland's key sectors, and in, in uh, you know life sciences, uh, in uh, energy, we've seen um, so in the food market, angelic gluten-free foods, um, who got fat fifty thousand pounds to start up. So they tend to follow um, market opportunities and new trends like premium food or gluten-free food, or you know, so a, a whole range of a whole range of companies. Some of the work you do is around um, banking, and you're you're working with banking and helping small SMEs to to get loans and you know to be financed. Yeah. Do you find that the banks are helpful in this? I've been very impressed with how much the banks want to work with us, um, and I, I have outlined this to the committee before. We began a programme a couple of years ago on, on access to finance, and we have these specialist access to finance advisors. We've worked with several of the banks now, getting their relationship managers together with our account managers, making all of our information available to them running seminars on how businesses grow. So um, I've been you know, very impressed with how much the banks want to engage. And we are seeing some improvements in terms of uh, the range of companies that apply for finance and get uh, finance that has been steadily improving. Well, it's good to hear that banks are uh, lending where they should be. Um, and Highlands and Islands, Alex, do you have any comments on those same questions? Same question, so blame me, right? Uh, <laughs> 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 well, just picking up one or two. I mean, I think in terms of um, the, the, the situation with banks, we, we've we've formed really good relationships with a lot of the banks over the last sort of year, eighteen months. Um, there's more liquidity in the banking system now than there's been for a long time, and um, you know, in terms of our businesses, when we ask them what are the big issues for them, you know, access to finance is still there, but it's not as big an issue as it was a year or so ago, so I wouldn't say the problem's been fixed. For, for, because for those to whom it is a problem, it is still a major problem, but the, the extent seems to have uh, diminished somewhat. And you know what we're finding working with the banks is that where we have clients in common, sitting down with the client together with the bank and putting together some deals that maybe individually we might not have been able to do, but we've both been able to invest in a business and, 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 move, and, and move things forward. In terms of account management, um, I think I said to the committee last time I was here, we were um, you know, undertaking a review of account management, which is not yet complete, but um, all I would say is that certainly the initial indications are very positive in terms of the difference it's making and the additionality that's, that's um, been you know, being achieved through, through account management. And uh, the range of services that are provided seems to be well regarded by, uh, by businesses. In terms of entrepreneurship, um, exactly the same as Lena, we focus on those entrepreneurs who are running businesses who can grow. Um, 
we have two main ways of doing it. One is through our leadership programme, which we partner with the IOD on, and the second one is through a partnership with MIT, uh, and I think about 50 businesses, roughly, 50 entrepreneurs from the Highlands, have participated in the I M I MIT programme over the last year, either out there, but increasingly through masterclasses run by... Um, by a, it's part of an entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial program here at, in Scotland. So entrepreneurship and leadership, really, really important as part of our support to businesses. I'm not sure if I covered all your questions there, Margaret, but okay, thank some you. of them anyway. Thanks, Karina. Uh, Alison Johnson had a supplementary, I think. Yeah, um, if I can just pick up on, on the Amazon question, I understand that you're saying it's, it's not for you to decide whether or not giving money to Amazon's a good thing. There just seems... There's an assumption that it's a good thing. I mean, obviously, if we're giving funding that comes from the Scottish taxpayer to a company and we're helping them buy property and so on but we don't appreciate what's happening when uh, you know the taxes if those employed by Amazon go to the exchequer we might be having to boost some of the you know poor wages for example through tax credits and so on who would have the information overall I mean we had Hugh Andrew from Berlin Books in this very committee and he pointed out that by giving money to Amazon every book he sold w was undercut by them, putting him at a really serious competitive disadvantage, and this is a small indigenous company. So does, has someone done the maths at a higher level? But I'm, I'm not sure we, we have given Amazon any money in the last year or not, so I want to, I need to clarify that. We did this about a year ago, I think, at the committee as well, so I'm not sure Amazon have had anything. Regional Selective Assistance looks at... Um, two things, and without going into the economic jargon, it looks at additionality and it looks at displacement. And regional selective assistance would not be able to be given to a company if um, there was not a, a proof uh, looking at all the calculations that this was truly additional to the Scottish economy. So if it was merely causing displacement somewhere else in the case that you, you gave, then regional selective assistance would be in question. So I think to, to, to what you're saying, Alison, there is a bigger um, moral and philosophical issue here, absolutely. Um, and so I'm not saying that that's not the case. And I think I said this the last time too. But my job in the stewardship of Scottish enterprise with public funds is to look at economic impact and to make sure that everything we do yields a return. And I know that uh, for our activity is anything up to £9 back to the Scottish economy. So I'm not saying there are not other issues that have to be looked into, but in terms of everything we do, we do look at displacement and we do look at whether it's additional to the economy. I do have other questions, Convener, but I don't know if you want to come back to me later. Okay, I can come back to you in a little while because I want to bring a couple of others in. Fine. Joan McAlpin. Thanks. Um, you mentioned earlier about uh, the success of your focus on exports and growth, and you talked about the SDI network. Can you give us some indication as to how the network has grown in recent years? Well, we've uh, um, opened five new offices just in the past couple of years. So if I, if I talk to you about uh, an S uh, SDI um, services, both Scottish Enterprise and Tiles and Ells Enterprise, um, so we've uh, almost 100 people now throughout 28, or is it 28 or 29, 28 yeah, offices throughout the world. Um, so Calgary, Ghana, Kenya, Saudi, uh, second office in, in Shenzhen and China, those would be examples of the, the office network. In addition to that, we've got some 600 global Scots throughout the world who we use extensively. Uh, I think the term I used before was we ruthlessly exploit them for Scotland's advantage and we use them uh, very well. Um, and then where we don't have SDI offices throughout the world, we uh, work with UKTI to um, use their office network throughout the world also. Right, OK. In terms of the balance between um, the SDI network and your global Scots and the use of embassies, what would you say was the most useful in terms of delivering for Scottish Oh, business? I mean, our, our activity is almost really mostly through um, our, our overseas offices, our, our office network of the 28 offices and all of our staff throughout the world. I mean, that's their job. They are our foot soldiers. They are our sales force. They are our eyes and ears. Uh, Global Scots all have day jobs. They do a tremendous amount for us, and they're an extension to our workforce, but they're not our workforce. So absolutely, first and foremost, it's our office network. Yeah, bang for your buck, it's the, it's the SDI uh, absolutely, network. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. OK. Um, that's great. I just wanted to pick up on uh, what you mentioned earlier in your submission about the number of uh, Scottish companies that have benefited from the Commonwealth Games and that that being far greater than the Olympics. 
have you any idea why uh, we've been more successful with the Commonwealth Games than we were with the Olympics in terms of? Well, I think Commonwealth Games is on, on the doorstep, so for some smaller companies it, it's, it's easier, and I think we learned a lot. I mean, Scottish companies did well, we had, had a lot of workshops, they did well at the Olympic Games, but I think we've learned a lot from that, and we've had a really relentless focus. We've run event after event, we've had uh, communications campaigns, marketing campaigns, we've made sure every account manager understands what the, the programme is, all the business gateway offices understand, so we've had a real kind of Team Scotland uh, focus on that, Joan, so I think it's, it's here it's on our doorstep. It's been a real strap line for both organisations to take advantage of 2014 in every sense possible and view economic development through the lens of 2014 has been the language we've used. Um, and uh, there's been this real focus. We've learned a lot and it's on our doorstep. Obviously, your focus on sectors and on exports has, has been successful. Do you have a strategy for regional disparities across Scotland? in terms of, you know, some regions are doing a lot better than others, perhaps because they have more of a focus on the sectors that you've chosen to concentrate on? The issue of regional equity is, is really vitally important. I, I think I have said this before, that we won't have a successful Scotland if, you know, large parts of Scotland are not participating uh, in that. So, for example, if I think of the work that we've been doing in Ayrshire with the three councils, actually looking at additional account management support, um, looking at the impact companies like GSK can have in the area, uh, working with uh, East Ayrshire particularly on the back of what's been happening on the coal industry, so specialised uh, uh, programmes there. Um, I myself was with the, the Crichton Campus Leadership Group a couple of weeks ago, helping them with, well, what kind of assets do you have that we can exploit? The advantage of Scottish Enterprise is that we can put our people and our resources anywhere in Scotland but it's got to be about not just a needs-based approach, it's got to be about what assets can we exploit for economic advantage, because then we could be ploughing money into things and getting no return. Um, but where there are opportunities, and I think it's our job to help areas of Scotland have that opportunity. We also have a location director, a very senior member of staff for every single local authority in our uh, area now, and uh, I sit on the National Community Planning Partnership uh, Steering Group, and we have a very senior member of every community planning partnership, and I think that's a great opportunity for putting the economy at the heart of that and helping community planning partnerships, particularly in areas of maybe more disadvantage, look at the economic opportunity. You come from a lead background, comparing what the structure then under the LEX and now when you're working with different partners like local authorities, do you think things have improved under the current system or do you think there was a clarity with the LEX that allowed more of a regional focus? Um, I think, well, 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 there was certainly a clarity in that you, you knew you had a Scottish Enterprise Fourth Valley or a Scottish, so, but that was also a kind of ceiling on ambition. So when I was in Dumfries a couple of weeks ago and talking to them about that challenge, we actually have... Actually, we work with more companies than we did then. We have no less staff in the area. And if I think that the budget for Scottish Enterprise in Dumfries and Galloway was £10 million, that was a ceiling. So we didn't spend any more than that in Dumfries and Galloway. There is no ceiling now. If there are opportunities to spend 20, 30, 40 million in Dumfries and Galloway and we can help them do that, we'll devote that resource to it. So actually, um, we can, we can um, do more for some areas of Scotland now and also we can mobilise our staff all over the country and bring much more resource to bear. So I think the results show that the impact is greater. We also only have one finance director, not 13, one HR director, not 13, one chief executive, not 13. So I think it's much, the clarity is much greater and all the evidence would support that. During our Access to Finance inquiry, um, Ms McDougall mentioned Access to Finance earlier, but we looked at some of your account managed companies and their access to finance at um, the beginning of the year and there was huge regional discrepancies in there were also sectoral discrepancies but there were big regional discrepancies in access to finance even amongst your account managed companies what are you doing to tackle that putting extra resource into that i mean the, the so it's not just access to finance i think a really important thing has been how a lot of um, rural companies um, are, are run and what their ambitions are, how many of them are participating internationally. So we've had 1,500 rural leaders through a very dedicated rural leadership programme. Alex talked about the importance of leadership, uh, and I think that we'll see that 
come through, Joan, in terms of the ambition, the ability, the ability to have a growth plan for your company? Because access to finance isn't always about the availability of finance. It's about the fact that the company doesn't have a business plan that can be supported. Uh, and a lot of rural businesses are smaller businesses and uh, you know, haven't really been, been through that. So working in this community of them, working together, and I think that's that, that whole approach to rural businesses is really important. Uh, the rural businesses, in terms of our account-managed uh, portfolio, has also um, increased uh, last year, so bringing as many businesses as we can into account management. But it's, also going to be, it's always going to be a challenge. Thank you. Um, Richard Baker. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask uh, what progress has been made through the, the Scottish Investment Bank. And Dr. Wilson, you talked at some length about your aspiration to grow your account management portfolio, but um, why that's seen as a, as a priority rather than, for example, uh, investing more through the Scottish Investment Bank or or, co -op or um, your co-investment strategy? So what, what's the, the balance, what's the decision you make there in terms of where, where provides the greatest bang for the buck for your, for your budget? It'll always be account management first because it's it's companies that uh, grow the economy. The existence of a Scottish investment bank in itself doesn't do anything. We have to have companies to apply it to. So we grow more companies and then we grow more demand for investment. Then we'll grow the Scottish investment bank accordingly. But remember, the Scottish investment bank is all about uh, co-investment. So actually, it's about the leverage that we, uh, we create through that. So Scottish investment bank is actually not just about public funds into companies, it's about getting the market to operate. Um, uh, so number one for me is growing the account managed companies, growing the growth company base in Scotland, and then everything else follows that. And in terms of um, growing um, company activities in relationship with companies, obviously you also have Cooperative Development Scotland as well. And uh, what um, potential do you see for further activity by Cooperative Development Scotland? What progress is being made through that activity? And do you, find, do you think there's more that Scottish Enterprise can do in terms of working with um, businesses looking to have non-traditional um, alternative business models, uh, including cooperatives? Um, well, last year, uh, CDS supported 36 employee ownership and uh, co-op ventures um, and, and you know so I, I think that's that's up on the year before um, the the cooperative development model or employee ownership model I think is really important and we'll do as much as we can to support that at the last meeting of all the industry leadership group chairs which um, the cabinet secretary for uh, well, Mr Swinney chairs uh, and it's, so it's the leaders of, of all of the industries all of the regional advisory boards they had a presentation on cooperatives and uh, you know in terms of how that could apply to the other sectors so that that's really getting uh, out there Richard it's very important all and every business model should be looked at in terms of what's appropriate for a company and cooperatives and employee ownership are, are one such model. Very encouraging. And returning um, just to the issue of account management, and you said why that is such a priority for you. And you mentioned earlier the, um, the evaluation of your engagement with account <coughs> managed companies which published in September. Um, that talks about several challenges that remain for Scottish Enterprise in terms of its approach to account management. Um, you've mentioned the issue of churn already, which you say has improved the, the, um, the issue of the number of companies exiting from account management. In that report, was still deemed to be low, but I think you said there's been progress there. But it also said that in spite of improvements, there remain significant gaps in Scottish Enterprises management and performance data for account managed uh, companies. So how are you addressing that challenge uh, and the other challenges which were actually outlined in that evaluation report in terms of your account managed companies? Mm. Well, we take that, take that very seriously. I mean, I was uh, delighted that the, the, the Parliament, uh, Scottish Parliament, endorsed the work in the debate uh, of the work of Highlands and Isles and Scottish Enterprise in terms of account management, because I think it really is our flagship, uh, our flagship uh, way of um, improving the economy um, and my obsession with evidence means that I've got to be careful because I'm only as good as the data that I have so I think these were talking about improvements and what's already robust uh, data but if you look at for example last year our account managed turnover growth from our portfolio was one point just under 1.4 billion compared to a billion the year before so it's that kind of data, and a lot of it is down to the fact that when do companies have their annual accounts, how good are their business plans and accounts, how robust is all of that. Um, but it's, it's not something that concerns me. It's about you know, natural improvements that we should be making. 
Those improvements are, are ongoing. Yes, I'm going through, yes. And my final question, uh, convener, is simply um, Joe McAlpine raised the issue of the Commonwealth Games. It's very important. I'm sure you'll agree that the benefit of that is felt by businesses throughout Scotland. And I understand that only two businesses in the North East benefited from contracts for the Commonwealth Games. I don't know if that's an accurate figure or not. But, I mean, do you, do you, do you, are you confident that, in fact, the whole of Scotland beyond Glasgow is uh, fairly benefiting from the economic impact of the Commonwealth Games? I'm confident that the message went out to every single company that would be eligible. I don't know if it was only two uh, or not, but I can tell you that they're not all companies in Glasgow. I mean, um, they're all over Scotland. Um, I don't have the breakdown in front of me, but I could get it to you. So I'm confident that the opportunity has been there for every single <coughs> organisation in Scotland that would be relevant. Thank you. Can I just, before I bring in Alison Johnson, can I just ask a supplementary to, to Richard Baker's first question, which was about the Scottish Investment Bank. Yeah. There, there were plans for the Scottish Business Development Bank, which the Scottish Government announced two or three weeks ago was, was not to proceed. What, what was Scottish Enterprise's involvement with that? Uh, Scottish Enterprise were involved as a part of a working group led by the Scottish Government looking into the feasibility of a Scottish Business Development uh, Bank, and we were providing evidence, data, looking at the market, looking at what's been happening through Scottish Investment Bank and looking at, uh, you know, what, what would be beneficial. Right. And, and, and was it disappointing to you that that didn't proceed? Um, I'm not, I mean, again, I work on the evidence. I'm not disappointed one way or the other. We need the institutions that we need to impact the economy. And uh, if there's an opportunity to grow the Scottish Investment Bank even further, uh, because the market is there and the opportunity is there, then that's a very good thing. Uh, and uh, what we call something, I don't think we should get too hung up about. It's what's happening in the economy, the leverage we're getting and the investment that we're making in growth companies. Um, Alison Johnson. Thank you. Um, we know that globally levels of company ownership amongst women is stubbornly low, and it's a problem that we have here too. Um, uh, out of the 43 high-growth entrepreneurs we heard about earlier, do, uh, is there a decent percentage of those? Are they women? When you say a decent percentage, I would imagine you would be disappointed with the answer. I often find myself the only female chief executive in a room uh -huh, as well, I'm so sure it is do. an issue about uh, how we bring women through. We're working just now with a couple of groups in terms of how we get more of the high impact entrepreneurs as women. So we're, we're very mindful of that. And is there any other tailoring of our support that we should be doing? Scottish Enterprise for years has, has gathered a lot of evidence of, of you know, why women do or don't start businesses, how they grow, do they internationalise or not, how do women access finance? We've got a lot of data. Um, there's been a lot of specialised support for women in starting up businesses uh, in, in the last few years. But I don't know how many of the, the high growth or the high impact are... are yeah, I, I, I don't know that specific question. But we do, we do obviously monitor the, the uh, equality issues right across the board and the, the companies and the businesses that we work with. Uh, and I believe that of the, the businesses accessing our services for the first time, uh, the number of women-owned businesses increased from 26% in 2010 up to 35% in 2012. So that's obviously a, a good increase, but obviously still more to go on that. I would say then, if, if that's a start-up, you'd want the flow-through as they grow to make sure you keep capturing that 30-odd percent, and you know that would bode well for the future. One of your um, key priorities is innovation, and obviously that's got the potential to positively impact on your other key priorities. But why do you think it remains the case that while our universities are sort of globally recognised for, for the work they're doing, that businesses aren't exploiting the opportunities to, to innovate? What's holding them back? And I notice as well that you're, <coughs> you're uh, looking at a wider innovation approach to increase by 4,000. That's a big increase. The number of Scottish companies actively developing new and improved products. I mean, that, that's obviously a great challenge, but what's holding us back and how will we reach that target? I think um, in, in terms of innovation, a lot of companies think that innovation is uh, product development or prototyping or R&D. They don't think about it in terms of innovating their business model, so employee ownership, for example, or you know, day-to-day -day innovation inherent in the workplace or uh, um, you know, innovation around the workforce. So it's, it's about saying that it's not just kind of high-floating R&D, although that's really important because our Baird statistic business expenditure on R&D in Scotland 
is not uh, high enough. So we work extensively on that. So I think there's a, a message there. It's almost the same thing around internationalisation. And companies who innovate tend to be more, uh, tend to export more, and companies that export more tend to innovate. So they really go hand in hand. So working on the kind of ambition, the leadership, and that uh, innovation it can be pervasive in a company, it can be a route to growth, and having more innovative companies. And that's why we talk about being innovation active. So it isn't just about uh, R and D. It is about getting that message that this is not a fancy thing for other companies. It's a thing for you because you can do it and it's your route to business success. So we now have uh, 15 specialists supporting 1,500 companies in Scotland already. Uh, and they are you know, absolute experts in all aspects of innovation. And they are part of our specialist team who support the account managers. On another issue, um, looking at renewable energy and the, the opportunities we have there, you say we will support industry innovation to, to lower the cost of offshore renewable energy and help them access finance for investment. Now, that's obviously massively needed. And you're saying that in 2014 to 15, you will, through Reef, lever 50 to 70 million into renewable energy. I, is that enough? Um. I think it's enough in terms of where the market is at the moment. So a lot of this is about stimulating a market. And, um, I mean, with the kind of uncertainties over EMR, the electricity market reform, it's held back some investment. So, you know, REEF is really important. And, uh, again, if we have to extend that because of the demand, then that's a matter for Ian and I to work on in terms of our business plan. But I think it's sufficient just now in terms of what the demand is, and we do more to stimulate that. What stage of a, you know what stage does a project have to be at in order to access that finance? Does it have to be so far down the road before it can tap into that investment? No, it could be a project from in, in, in initiation, used for community purposes, used for you know all, all sorts of all sorts of, of uh, issues. A lot of communities have come forward to access it district heating, things like that. And lastly, Jake Wood. Thank you. Um, let me start with the overall overarching need for how we market Scotland. There's the adage which I bore people with endlessly about a brand that has a story to tell has meaning and a brand that has meaning has impact on residents. What's the story about Scotland, the brand, as far as you're concerned? I think Scotland's brand is about um, premium. So it's about uh, premium in everything. It's about high class and, and top notch universities and education, outstanding people, fantastic natural assets and wind, wave, tidal renewables, uh, our larder in terms of food, health enhancing foods, our, 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 our fish, our meat. Um, and it's about added value and premium. And if you look at the kind of foreign investment we're getting and how Scotland is being known internationally, it is for that high quality, high value things in our people, our places and all of our other assets. Very much the same. I think it's a combination of the of the natural and the historical values married with the real opportunities of the future. We'll talk about opportunities of the future, we may, uh, we may have a difference in the view as to how we feed the pipeline. And, and Alison uh, Johnson mentioned innovation and knowledge transfer and the universities. But there, um, as I said, we may differ about the varied regional performances of Business Gateway in terms of feeding through the winners. Um, Alec, you mentioned in your paper supporting businesses and social enterprises to shape and realise their growth aspirations. I chair the cross-party group on social enterprise. What's a social enterprise? Goodness, I think I wrote to you about this uh, after the after the session two two um, <coughs> two sessions ago. I mean, we, I mean, we, we, there, are, there are definitions of social enterprise. I don't have them off the top of my head, but we work with social enterprises on exactly the same basis as we as we do with businesses. I mean, the, the purpose is obviously for social social benefit. So we account manage some 120, 130 social enterprises across the Highlands and Islands and have access to the full range of our services just as any other sort of business model uh, would have. Vitally important part of the regional economy. Thank you. I mean, one of the things that the actual social enterprise community is tussling with is 
qualifying what's a social enterprise and what's not. In Glasgow, we now have 590 social enterprises. Their aspirations are not being fulfilled because they don't see where they fit in the pipeline and how they're qualified. And one suggests that they're not qualified properly and don't have the right support. In fact, don't have, and they don't have, uh, in all cases, access to finance. You know, there seems to be a two-tiered level, and I understand why, you know, given resources, etc., that a lot of focus from the agencies goes on high-growth companies. I'm not sure where your focus is in terms of picking up those small businesses through Business Gateway or, indeed, the very many uh, good social enterprises that will be the champions of the future. I mean, how are you picking them up? How do you engage? Well, there's two questions. In terms of where the, um, the new businesses come from, and part of that is through Business Gateway. So we're working with Gateway to make sure that those businesses who are coming through the growth pipeline come out the other end into account management. And I can't remember the figure off the top of my head, but a high percentage of those that are proposed to us by Business Gateway we take into account management. But that's only one aspect of it. Um, going back to something somebody else mentioned earlier, we are seeing quite a number of um, uh, good high growth potential startups across the Highlands and Islands just now. They'll be in account management from, from a very early stage, given the scale and the sectors uh, that they're actually in. And the third way is just you know, our, our, our teams on the ground, you know, knowing what's happening out and about across the Highlands and Islands, we'll be identifying new businesses and, and, and so on for account management. But in terms of social enterprise, it's exactly the same. You know, it's a fundamental part of our strength and communities remit. We account manage um, roughly 50 communities. And the organisation that we work with to take forward communities is, in many cases, social enterprises. So if a, if a community has got an anchor organisation, a social enterprise or other, and has the, uh, a plan for growth, then we will support it financially, advisory, and other things, as well as we would do, if you like, other mainstream businesses. And we even go beyond that, because in the last year, we've actually launched a new programme called Community Capacity Building. And it sort of does what it says in the tin. There are many community groups and social enterprises who need a bit of extra help to actually get projects off the ground and into reality, and therefore the community benefit to be derived. So we're putting extra resource into that type of uh, programme, into that type of organisation, community groups, community enterprises, social enterprises, to actually leverage even further than we've done before the, uh, the impact that that sort of organisation can have. And I could take you to some in Inverness, such as, you know, New Start Highland or um, the, uh, the, the social enterprise that's going to build a new hotel on the campus, but equally across the Highlands and Islands, where, you know, they are significant organisations and we're investing significant businesses uh, we're investing significant sums because they're delivering economic and community benefits. Yeah, that, that's my problem. We're investing significant sums. But my question really is, how are we sure that we're picking the winners and not dissipating the funds, that are, the many funds uh, that are available so that we are looking for an investment which will provide ultimately a return, significant return, as a high-growth company managed by the enterprise agencies? I don't see that engagement. I mean, I know you support social enterprises, but I don't see the feed through. And you talk about startups. If I look at survival rates, it then makes me more concerned about where we're placing our investments in terms of making sure that it's focused. I mean, how can we better that, uh, the current situation? Startups is not our core business. That is business KB. But what the point I was making, there are some high growth startups of, of, of Forgive me, so, so that we're clear. Lena said early on, you are responsible. And I, in my book, you're the economic gurus that you ultimately are dependency. And Scotland's enterprising and economic future depends ultimately, maybe wrongly, but ultimately, in my opinion, on the four people and your teams sitting in this room. And that includes business gateways, and that includes, as far as I'm concerned... Well, the results speak for themselves. So my job and Alex's job on behalf of this entire country is to spend, invest all of our tax funds wisely. And we need to do that by investing in the things that are most likely to generate a return for the Scottish economy, increase GVA, and give people high-quality, sustainable jobs. That's our role. And I am unapologetic about that, and I am very proud of the work that's been done because the return to the Scottish economy shows that I'm sure we've got lots to learn, and I'm not saying we'll never make mistakes, but by and large, I think we're getting greatest value out of our economic development agencies than we ever, ever did. I'm questioning how you engage and bring through 
the winners from the lower tiers, if you like. So, so we, there, is, there is absolutely, it doesn't matter what the business model is. If you're a social enterprise and can be a high growth enterprise, then we're blind to that chick. It doesn't matter. Now, if you're raising a question about how better access, better communication, how we can engage, then maybe that's something we should look at. But there is absolutely nothing stopping any social enterprise with high growth potential, high growth potential, from being supported by Scottish Enterprise, and I'll speak for Highlands and LZ Enterprise too, that is a myth that I absolutely want to bust. We are there to help any and every high growth company. For the pudding will be in the eating. Uh, just, just, eating, just let me, though. one last thing, if I may. One of the areas, we, we, we talked about renewable energy, we talked about energy, uh, one of the key ingredients for our economic growth is the skill of our people. I mean, again, in terms of engagement with, I mean, how, how do you coordinate engagement with, like, for SDS in terms of looking at forward at your plans and how to engage with, with their plans? Hand in glove. So for every key sector in Scotland, there is now an industry skills plan and we have regional skills plans too. So um, for renewables and for oil and gas and energy, there is a, a skills plan that looks at uh, future flow, it looks at high level skills, it looks at numbers of apprentices required. Uh, and uh, that's done hand in hand with our sector led, industry led, industry leadership groups. It's stronger than it's ever been. Thank you. Right, well, that's almost precisely on time, so very well done. Thank you uh, to our witnesses for coming along this morning and helping us uh, with our inquiries, and perhaps we can follow up afterwards the uh, budget issues we were talking about uh, at the start of the meeting. Um, and thank you. At this point, we'll have a short suspension.
Oh, Reconvene, please. Oh, Thank you very much. Right okay, we're on item um, three on the agenda. This is consideration of a piece of subordinate legislation, and we have order. Order. Thank you. We have before us the uh, Insolvency Scotland Amendment Rules 2014, SSI 2014-114, uh, 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 which restate provision in the Insolvency Rules in relation to receivership and the process of liquidation to remove the application of provisions of the Bankruptcy Scotland Act 1985 and also restating other rules in relation to liquidation and administration for that purpose. Do any members have any issues they want to raise in relation to this instrument? Are we ever uh, content simply to uh, note uh, the terms of the instru instrument? Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, at this point we will go into private session. Thank you.